Well, ma magnetic fields are quite mysterious things. And so the question first on our minds is, what's the origin of magnetic fields? And the answer to that is moving charge. Now, that seems a bit strange because, of course, we're used to um, a bar magnet and we, that's the sort of first type of magnetic field we come across uh, when we're learning in, in science, a bit of science in sort of early year school. And of course, they're very mysterious things. And we know that they have a North Pole and a South Pole and um, they attract other magnets. Well, where's the moving charge? Uh, well, it's not obvious and, it and you don't need to know this, but it turns out and it's nice to know that it's actually the electron spin that's responsible for magnetic field in some materials. And we know that things like iron, nickel and cobalt uh, metals, transition metals, can, can behave, can generate magnetic fields because of this. So, well, that's just kind of a good thing to know um, as a bit of general knowledge. But in this section, we're, all, we're more interested in the magnetic fields that are generated by electric current, which is, of course, moving charge. And so we might be equally familiar with a kind of coil and the idea that that generates a magnetic field. <clears throat> well, let's just look back at that, this bar magnet one more time, because what's not often commonly understood is the idea that actually the magnetic field lines don't sort of, they, they are continuous. They actually go through the metal as well. And it turns out that magnetic field lines always go in a complete loop. You never find one. It, they're unlike electric field lines and gravitational field lines. Um, you may have at least studied electrical fields and which come from a point charge. But in magnetic fields, there's no such thing. And so I'm doing a fairly bad job of drawing these loops, but I'm keeping them in a sensible shape. But there we are. They're, they're always continuous loops. And they do have a direction. Well, they go from, the convention is they go from North Pole to South Pole. But what starts to get a bit confusing is, well, what, you know, if that's true, then okay, then they go, say, for example, around in that direction. Um, but where do we decide that the North Pole is? Because it's a continuous loop. And, uh, well, it's a bit of an illusion, actually. And the North Pole is what the name given to the point at which magnetic field tends to emerge from something that we look at as a magnet. So for example, if we have a permanent magnet, we just call the, the end where the magnetic field lines emerge, the North Pole. It's an arbitrary choice, actually. And we call the, the, the end where the magnetic field lines tend to go into the material, the South Pole. And so in that, that way, we start to, we talk about North and South Pole, even though in reality is you never, um, you, these only exist when you have something, a kind of boundary, a point that you want to consider. So the electric field around a coil or a solenoid with a current going through it, well, now we know we've definitely got moving charge and we'll come back to how that generates a field later on. But um, the, the field looks very similar. There's similar sort of loops kind of going around and doing a very similar sort of pattern to a bar magnet. And so something like this. And we and this time we say that the North Pole is the end of the solenoid. We just choose it to be the end of the solenoid where the field lines are emerging from. And the South Pole is the end of the solenoid where the field lines are going into. But how do we know the direction that the field goes around in these loops? Well, there's a rule called the grip rule, which is worth knowing, and you might know it from GCSE or IGCSE. And if you put your fingers in the direction of the, the current in the coil, then your thumb points to the North Pole. Now, in my uh, example here, well, we, I've got the current coming kind of down the front here, so it's coming down these kind of frontal coils and then going up behind. So hopefully, if you use the grip rule, you can see, ah, yes, well, in this case, that's the North Pole and this is the South Pole. But of course, the same thing applies with the bar magnet. The field lines um, are actually continuous. I mean, there's in one way, you could say that inside the coil, the field lines are actually going from, quote, south to north, because we're calling the South Pole the left-hand side and the North Pole the right-hand side. But, um, but we say that in the airspace, 
in the space around the magnet, the field lines are going from north to south. So that's the convention. So let's just kind of um, write those rules down. Um, and so one by one. Well, the first thing to say is that magnetic field lines always form complete loops. And we've said that a north pole is where field lines appear to exit a permanent magnet or a coil. And we've used the grip rule to decide where the north pole is. In, in a bar magnet, you could use plotting compasses. Um, you may have used those before. If you get a little compass, the needle will always follow the field lines. And so it will point towards the south pole, which is a bit confusing because in the Earth, doesn't a compass point to the North Pole? Well, bear in mind that what, we, what is commonly known as the North Pole of the Earth, which has a magnetic field, is really, in physics terms, a South Pole. So it's worth knowing that, as a general knowledge as well. Uh, so, uh, and in the same way, a South Pole is where field lines appear to enter into the um, permanent magnet or the coil. And Fields go from north to south, so when we've defined these poles, field lines always go from the north to the south. Uh, I should maybe put on a few more arrows coming out here to show what I mean. Um, and finally, um, the, the, as with all fields, the closer the lines are together, the stronger the field. So how do we treat magnetic fields? Magnetic fields and the physics of magnetic fields evolved in a different way to that of electric fields and gravitational fields. And it was Michael Faraday who uh, first defined the idea of magnetic flux and it has the symbol uh, phi, Greek letter phi, which looks like this. And, um, and he defined the amount of magnetic field with, in that way. He said it's a flux, a kind of flow of something flux usually refers to. It's, borrowed, it's actually taken from fluid mechanics originally. Anyway, so there's this idea of uh, amount of field, you know, the amount, the number of field lines, if we look at it more abstractly. Uh, it has a unit, and the unit of flux is the Weber, uh, which has the symbol WB. Uh, well, that gives us a way of um, thinking about magnetic field strength. You know, let's have a look at um, a situation here. Let's suppose we've kind of created an area of nice uniform magnetic field. And we know that the field strength is um, to do with how close those lines are together. So let's see how that's going to relate to flux. Well, field strength, magnetic field strength, is considered to be the amount of field passing through a unit area. So we can actually write down there, and we can write down an equation in terms of flux. Magnetic field strength is given the symbol B, and we say magnetic field strength is the flux per unit area, which gives an idea of the sort of density, the compactness of those field lines, you know, how close together they are, how many you've got, how many Webers you've got going through a unit area. And in fact, there's an alternative name for magnetic field strength, which is, um, I'll put here, also known as, aka, magnetic field strength is also known as magnetic flux density, uh, because, for that, this very reason. Uh, because phi over A is um, well described by that phrase. Well, magnetic field strength or magnetic flux density, whichever uh, description you, where we use, um, given by the symbol B, has units, therefore, of the Weber per metre squared. So, yes, so Weber metres to the minus two. Well, that's actually renamed as the Tesla. So we'll write that right there, the T, or the Tesla. We often want to consider situations where magnetic field is arriving at a coil um, or arriving near a, an area of a circuit, a conductor, something like that. 
and how much passes through a particular area. So let's just look at that diagrammatically. Well, if we sort of plug an area into a field then, then we can sort of get the idea of kind of how this might work. We can see there, if that's an area, if that's an area A, well, the equation tells us that we can calculate the amount of flux, the amount of field, because phi, the amount of flux, will be B multiplied by A. Uh, the thing is that what happens if the, air, if the field arrives at some coil or something, but not perpendicular? Well, then we might have a bit of a problem. So let's, let's suppose that we imagine a, a, an area looking like this and plug this one into the field. So there we go. So that might be there. Well, we can sort of see how much flux is going to go through the area this time. Hmm. Nothing, because you can kind of see that the field lines are kind of hitting it end on, and nothing is actually, no, none of it is actually passing through that rectangle. So we've got two, we've got two extremes here. We've got one where we're maximising the amount of field going through, and one where we're minimising the amount of field going through. Well, it turns out in magnetic fields, we have to look at area in this way, and we have, it's actually, we're kind of considering it as a vector with a direction. So, well, if I, um, we usually draw it by drawing the normal to the area. And you'll know what it means by normal, the perpendicular to the surface. You'll know from sort of ray diagrams and things like that. Well, in each case, I mean, in, in this case, we can see that that normal is going to be at 90 degrees to our field. Whereas in the, in the original case, well, it's actually zero degrees. It's actually in line with the field. So look, let's, let's look at the general case. So let's get a kind of oblique um, area and sort of plug that in. So you can see what we're doing there is kind of just tilting that area over so that it's kind of not flat but not perpendicular, somewhere in between. And we'll, draw, we'll do the same process. We'll draw the normal on uh, to that area. So that would point in that direction. And then we'll just label the angle this time between the field, which is horizontal in this case, and we'll label that as theta. Well, that enables us to write down to an improvement to our expression for, ma for magnetic flux. So we can actually now write that magnetic flux is B times A times the cosine of the angle. And for those people doing vector maths, this is basically dot product but uh, of two vectors, the flux density and the area. But if you're not doing that, don't worry. You can see that this formula works really well. If we put in theta equals zero, as in the first case, well, let's see what happens. Well, if theta equals zero, that means that the flux, is, uh, that cosine zero is one, so that means we're maximizing the flux and we're getting a flux of B times A. Meanwhile, if we look at the other extreme here, where theta equals 90 degrees, well, cosine 90 is zero, and so it works out again that we get no flux this time because uh, we just get B times A times zero. So we get flux going through our area is zero. And of course, the general case is our, when we have um, B, A, and we have some angle theta, cosine theta. Uh, so that becomes our equa the, uh, an important equation, to be able to find the amount of flux going through an area when we have the area, the normal to the area is at an angle theta to the magnetic flux density or the magnetic field lines. Good. So I hope that makes sense. We're going to be, we'll be going on to use that quite a lot more. Just one last comment that is just worth knowing and bearing in mind, that if we have, um, we, because I said that area, strangely, we're thinking of as a vector, well, it is, of course, then possible that we could turn it around altogether. And, you know, let's just plonk that up here for a second. And, and I could point the normal the other way. And it's true to say that in that case, if we did do that, then we would get a negative flux. Sounds a bit strange, because flux is a scalar, 
And, but you can have scalars which are positive or negative. For example, energy intake. If you eat a, ma a certain amount of food and do a certain amount of exercise, well, the amount of energy going into your system could be bigger or smaller than the amount going out of your system. So you could end up with a net energy intake, which is negative, but energy is still a scalar. So we now just need to extend our idea of magnetic flux to, to, to be able to deal with real situations. So for example, we might want to decide what's going to happen when some magnetic flux meets a coil, as we mentioned in the last section. Well, let's see. Well, in this case, we've just got a nice simple magnetic field of field strength B, or flux density B, and it's meeting a coil nice and head on. So in other words, we don't have to worry about the angle because theta is zero, There, the normal to the area is, is in the same direction as the field. So we can kind of ignore theta, but we'll keep it in the equation. Remember that our equation is phi equals B A cosine theta. And that tells us how much flux is go how much flux is going through an area A. Well, when we've got a coil, you'll see this has got more than one coil. So we need to kind of take that into account. And we do that by just defining something called magnetic flux linkage. And it's quite a simple idea, really. We just stick an M in front of both sides. <laughs> so we don't change the equation really at all. But, um, but it does make a difference because then it tells us the amount of effective flux we've got going through a particular coil. It's going to be the flux going through the area of the coil multiplied by however many turns. Now that will make more sense as we go on. Uh, so for now, it's just important to realise just this little extension that n phi is known as the magnetic flux linkage, whereas phi was the magnetic flux. Great, so try one or two questions just as a quick check on this, and then we can get into how magnetic fields interact with each other.